All right, thanks everyone. Uh, so this uh, third tutorial of the module is uh, Song, Miltas, and Putri. So there are PhD students in a lab all working on geometrically learning in one form or another, actually nice diverse set of application areas. And uh, so today you will see a bit of like how the concept that we would discuss over the last couple of weeks translate to code again, just like the previous ones. And yeah, I really encourage everyone to ask questions, interrupt, uh, because this is a complex topic, so <laughs> you know this by now, and uh, it really helps, I think, to just take your time and, and pause for a moment. And I guess otherwise just, <laughs> just continue talking right, like I do, which is not always a good thing, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Tom, uh, take it away. Yeah, sure. So um, this tutorial will be um, kind of split into two parts. The first part will be um, with the invariant message passing, let's say. Uh, we will uh, show you guys the um, MPN, let's say, message passing network and message passing network with the um, attribute of the distance between the nodes and also the related position between the nodes um, to show that they are kind of invariant to rotations. And um, I, I think so, but how can I share to you guys? Um, it's just a link, so if can you send it to me via Slack, then I quickly upload it to Compass. Okay. Mm. Uh, Nick, if you can post it in WhatsApp. Uh, this version, do you have the GitHub version? This is the, the newest version, so yeah. Yeah, so maybe you continue about the rest of the session. Sure. So, um, um, where did I go? So, um, we have uh, split into two parts, and first is the invariant message passing, and the other parts will be deal with um, the serial graph convolution neural networks. And that is um, way more uh, expressive uh, than the um, invariant message passing. So um, the first part is um, to try to introduce yourself, uh, you guys, um, the graphs. So um, the first part will be introduction to the geometric graphs. Say that um, we have um, um, data in, in the form of graph in machine learning fields, for example, like the social um, network, sorry, and um, let's say the molecular network or maybe the protein structure that I'm, I'm working on. So there are all kinds of the, um, data which is in the form of the graph and we, can, and we can naturally represent them as a graph. So, um, but in the social network graphs, let's say um, the node is just, um, let's say the users and the edges are just the interaction between the users, but they, they have no geometric features within these graphs. And in this tutorial, we'll care more about the geometric graphs as we show here. So the, def the definition of the geometric graph, um, G equals to uh, set V, E, and X. And this uh, V is the, um, a set of the nodes that we have in the graph. And one sec. Oh yeah, they're they're requiring the... I think that you need to go to share. Wait, yeah. Um... Okay, sure. So, um, sorry? Okay, everyone got access? Cool. So um, within the geometric graph, we have um, nodes, edges, and it's a, a geometric space X. So um, we can have the feature map um, GV to uh, map our nodes features into a, um, let's say, um, vector field CV. And also we have the other, um, we can have the other feature map GV, uh, GE to, rep, uh, to let's say, map the edge attribute to a um, feature field um, CE. So we have these two um, features. And also we have the um, node position, let's say, um, the geometric um, um, attributes. So um, we can use the um, node positions and the node features to represent one node in our graph. And also we can use uh, one um, edge attribute to represent edges in our graph. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So um, the very basic um, type of the network in a graph neural network um, scheme is the message passing network. And it's fairly simple and it's followed from this paper, Neuro um, Message Passing for Quantum Chemistry. So um, the graph neural network is, um, is so firstly, they need to, sh um, they need to be, um, how do you say, the permutation equivariance, right? So uh, let's say um, this two graph, A and B, they have the same connectivity, they have the same set of nodes. So they should be um, viewed as equi equivariant in the view of um, a graph neural network. So we should model a network saying that um, whenever the model um, see these two graphs, they will represent as the same representation in the, in the hidden space. So uh, the message passing network, um, there are, um, the, we, we care much about its uh, message passing phase. So let's say it has um, um, three, um, stage. The first stage is to construct the uh, messages from the node, um, neighbor nodes to the central nodes, and we will use a um, MLP or let's say a function phi e here to um, to have our node uh, central node features. We have the um, neighbor node features, and also we have the edge attributes, and throw them into this function, and we have the messages from the node j to node i. And the second stage is to aggregate the um, information from the node to the central node, let's say. And here we only use a um, simple add aggregation to add them. And also we have the, um, the third stage is to update the messages from the, uh, the neighbor nodes to the central nodes. So we also have a function phi f to aggregate all the messages from, uh, um, from the neighbor nodes and this messages from the messages to the central node. And we have already the, um, um, central node features, and then we um, concate them together and throw them to the function, and we got the updated um, node features, node i features. Okay. So after that, we have the updated version of the um, embeddings of each of the node, and we um, consider we're doing some tasks, and uh, we need to aggregate all the information from each of the nodes to one graph representation, and that is called the uh, readout phase. So um, we will use um, some pulling method, uh, which is represented here as a um, R here. And we aggregate all the nodes, features from all the nodes, and we got the final one graph representation for each of the graphs. Any questions? Okay. Um, so yeah, this is um, typically the representation that we are using to represent one graph, let's say. So you can see that this is the nodes in one graph and we have the node features here uh, represented as a, a node feature matrix. And we also have its position and this is a 2D space. So we have the um, coordinates of, of the nodes here. And also we have the edge index represented as the connection between the, um, the nodes. Let's say if we see the first row here, it's um, zero one means that the um, zeroth nodes is connecting with one and vice versa here. And you can see all the connection recorded in this um, edge index. So we can use a node feature. Um, so we can use these three matrix, let's say to represent one graph. Okay, so um, the first thing is to um, show you guys what a message passing looks like in Torch Geometric. And that is kind of the package we're using to construct our graph neural networks. So, um, yeah, um, as I said before, we have uh, three stages. And um, first we have the message function, which we um, have the central node feature and the neighbor node feature and also the edge attributes. And here we um, concate them together and throw them in a MLP. And this is the um, two layer MLP with the uh, activation function here. And then we got the updated uh, no, uh, we got the messages from all the from the jth node to the ith node, and um, we're using the aggregation here to aggregate the nodes, um, the um, neighbor node to the central node um, for the message. And once we get that message, we concate the message with the um, previous node features, and we use an update net that is a two layer MLP as well to update this. Um, node feature and we got the final updated ver node feature. 
So this is a very simple um, MPLN layer in um, PyTorch geometric. So, yeah. And after we got one layer of MPN, we can construct the whole MPN network. You can, uh, let's also start from the four functions. So we have the um, X that is a node feature and we have um, two um, linear layer to convert it into a higher dimension of the hidden space. Then we have the, um, let's say the encoded node representation and for um, we, we can we can define um, as many layers as we want and we um, through these layers we um, pass the node feature edge index and edge attributes into the network um, that is the layer here MPN layer and we got the updated node features so after uh, several rounds of these layers we propagate through all of the um, MPN and we got the final updated um, whole node representation for each of the nodes. And then we, we want to do some tasks, let's say. Um, for example, in this tutorial, we, we are, we're doing um, the classification task for the super, um, how do you say, pixel um, data set, MNIST data set. So the final task is to use um, one graph to predict the digits of it. So um, here we're, we're going to use a polling method to pull all the X, let's say all the nodes into one graph. So for example, this X represents um, the nodes in 100 graphs. And after this pulling, then this X will be 100 times, let's say the hidden dimension of the graph, graph representation. So, so we have the 100 times, let's say 32, and we use MLP to convert this 32 back to one. That is um, the final um, process of doing this MPN. Sorry? 10, in this case, 10 digits. Yeah, 10 digits, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, 10, 100 times 10, that's, yeah. Two, so we, um, yeah. And this function here is trying to um, give you some visualization of um, how this, um, how this node, node feature looks like before we're doing this um, pulling methods. So we wanna, uh, we wanna um, present you guys saying that um, after we rotate our input, let's say the X, the uh, hidden representation here does not change because it is rotation invariant in the um, later part of this tutorial. But it's not, um, it has not been round. So um, I think, yeah, we need to run it till we see it. Okay, so yeah. So the, uh, the task here, as I said before, we're using the um, uh, 2D data, super pixel MNIST to, um, um, to construct the graphs out of it and use the MPN to uh, different types of MPN to predict the um, digits. So here we can visualize some of it. Let's say first we download it. Mm. Um, so is anyone not clear with the um, data format in Python geometric? That is a data data class. Don't be shy. Several in, sorry? What do you mean? The... I specified the, the data format. Yes, maybe, did any of you work with those geometric? No. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, yeah. So you can see uh, you can see that here, this is one data in in um, PyTorch geometric. Here it represents one graph. So this X, as I said before, it is um, the node feature, and we have seventy five nodes in one graph. A picture of the. Oh yeah, yeah. We can visualize it. So you can see that here we have uh, one instance from our from our um, data set. And you can see that this is a digit of four and we have um, converted this digit to uh, the nodes here. You can see that each of the this circle represents one node and we have the edge connection here. So yeah, so we have this whole data and inside this data, we have 75 nodes, let's say 75 circles. And we have the, 
a uh, 1000 nearly 1000s of the edges connecting connecting these nodes so this is represented as um two times uh one nearly 1000 and this two represents the first row is the um, um the central node index and the second row is the neighbor node index so that you have two rows right and also you have the Y here, Y is your um, label and the position is the uh, 2D coordinates of these nodes. So this is a 75 uh, times two, uh, 75 times two, yeah. And also um, here we wanna show you on three types of the um, uh, network, let's say the three types of the uh, feature we have. So the first one um, we have the, um, um, we have no uh, edge attributes here, as you, as you can see here. So we will not use any of the um, um, position information. And in the second type of the network, we have the edge attribute one, which is the distance between the nodes. So we have um, a nearly 1,000th of the connection. So we have the 1,000th of the distance. And also um, for the third net, we have the um, edge attributes and it has dimension of two, meaning that it is a relative position, let's say the vector between the node i and node j, let's say using the coordinates of node i minus the node j gives you a vector in dimension of two. So, yeah. So um, based on this three type of data, we will um, build three um, networks, let's say. And um, before that, I wanted to introduce you to um, the batching, uh, sorry. So um, I think this is, um, so this, um, for, so first we have this pixel and this node is, um, I think is constructed by um, the um, similarity of the pixels. And am I right? Are you, are you asking how the graph is constructed from the original image? Is that the question? Yeah, so you're measured density of pixels, right? And um, for each like, image, you say that you want If we translate uh, the digit to the corners of the image, do you still have like translation capillaries? Or... Uh, I think that this graph is really sort of snapped to the image. And if you, image, if you rotate, if you shift the image, the length of the graph, I think the graph will be shifted as well. Uh, but this, I think, <coughs> will matter in this case because it's just a graph floating around in space. Uh, but if you're going to leverage the global position of the nodes, as pieces, yeah, then you know you shift the branch unless you only use relative displacement filters, then you would be shifting the image. It's the kind of things that it will be better. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay, cool. So um before before um let's say construct our um trainer, I wanted to introduce you guys about the batching mechanisms in Pytorch geometric. So um for example, um in our data set, we have um, n graphs, and each of these graphs has different set of nodes. Um, but in the normal uh, batching mechanisms, we requ require that each of the, um, let's say, the um, data dimension should be the same so that it can be batched into a matrix, right? 
So how do we do this um, batch in PyTorch Geometric? So, um, so the mechanisms um, behind it is behind this is that PyTorch Geometric automatically, let's say, pad all this graph to the same size, and um, yeah yeah that's that's the mechanism behind it so what we see is that we have a um let's say um 32 graphs in one batch and pytorch geometric make this 32 graphs into one big graph but there's no connection between these 32 graphs and we have the batch index let's see here so we have the um, a train loader and um we define our um batch size and for each graph, so this graph is a batch graph, we can see that it has um, the, um, feature, um, the attribute of the batch, and we can see the shape, it's um, 4,800, and we have the batch size of 64 here. So um, you can see that this batch is it's just the index of each of the graph. Let's say we have a, um, 75 zeros here, meaning that the, the first 75 of nodes is coming from the first graph, and um, then ones and then twos, all the way to 63, because we have uh, 64 um, graphs here. So it's just, um, um, it gives you the index of each of the nodes coming from the different graphs. So yeah, so that's how we um, batch the graph. And here we just um, define our um, classifier in PyTorch Lightning. You can see that here we define our, um, MPN graph, uh, MPN model. We have the um, edge attribute, we have the um, edge index, we have the node, and we have the um, batch here. So, so that we uh, we pass this batch to our network, so the network can pull in the batch, uh, the the node into one graph, according to the um, their node index, graph index. So. Um, so let's start training it. I think I need I need to run this. Yeah, I think that we can uh, just combine to like one uh, node mm. to the So we will skip this part. So this part is the training part. And after trained your model, you will um, have these blocks running. So, um, so this is for the visualization of the rotated representations after uh, before the pulling. And after run these two blocks, you will see that um, the MPN distance uh, um, distance MPN is invariant to the rotations uh, um, because they are using the relative distance. And this distance is just a scalar value, which means that um, the identity uh, the identity matrix is just the um, the transformation matrix in uh, SO three here or SO two here. So it really doesn't uh, have anything um, change in your message. So in your whole network, so the hidden representation does not change. But whenever we goes to this um, relative position, that is, um, we have some vectorized um, feature here. So uh, whenever we rotate it, this two um, coordinates change, and thus this message change. So uh, with the same set of nodes, if we um, apply some rotation to this set of nodes, then the message will, won't be the same. Thus, it's not rotation in invariant. So yeah. So yeah, I think we finished the first, the first part of the first part, and the first, uh, the second part of the first part is to introduce you guys um, this EGN network and I think sure. you can go. So, you have questions so far? Everything is clear? Um, okay. Cool. Uh, so we, we saw uh, three different kinds of uh, message passing networks so far. Uh, we saw one that is agnostic to any kind of uh, geometric information. Um, then the second one um, is using the Euclidean distances between the nodes, which are invariant to rotations, 
to any uh, isometers really. Um, and then the third one was um, using the relative positions. And this makes it translation equivariant, uh, but uh, it is not equivalent to other transformations such as rotations. Uh, and so um, EGNN uh, was, uh, is a paper that was proposed um, two years ago, I think. Uh, and it's one of the simplest equivariant graph networks. Uh, and uh, if you look at the equations, they, um, they look very similar to uh, the standard message passing network equations. Uh, so uh, the first equation, for example, which is the message equation that we saw before, it's um, identical, let's say, to the, um, the equation, the message equation from the, um, the first, sorry, the second message passing network that we saw. Uh, the third equation is also the same, and, and the fourth equation is also the same. Um, the interesting thing that's happening and the different thing that's happening here is the second equation, um, in which uh, we um, we have an update function for the positions as well. So instead of uh, only updating the um, the node features, uh, which is a standard operation in graph networks, EGN also updates the node uh, positions. Uh, and so we have uh, this, this message ij is uh, a feature vector of arbitrary dimensionality, uh, but the function phi of uh, phi p um, here uh, is a neural network that outputs a scalar. Uh, so what we, if I, yeah, uh, wait. So this function here is a neural network uh, that takes as input an arbitrary feature vector and outputs a scalar. Um, and um, if we uh, <clears throat> uh, think about what's going on here, uh, we have um, an equivariant quantity, uh, which is uh, which are the relative positions here. And we multiply them with a scalar quantity, uh, which is uh, by design invariant. It is invariant because we we only use uh, invariant quantities to compute it. So we use the, uh, for example, we use here, we use the, uh, the Euclidean distance between the nodes. And so it is by design, uh, the multiplication of uh, an invariant scalar quantity with an equivariant quantity. And this, uh, it's interesting if you do the math, uh, this gives us an equivariant quantity. And then after that, we have a sum of equivalent quantities, which is also an equivalent quantity. Uh, and I encourage you to um, to derive the equations yourself. They're also part of the of this paper. Is that something? Um, yeah. Um, so um, this this equation, the second equation, is uh, pretty much what differentiates um, EGNN from uh, the message passing network that we saw before. Uh, and it makes uh, it makes EGNN equivalent to um, the group EN here. I guess you um, you saw that in the lectures. Um, so the group EN, uh, the Euclidean uh, group of dimensionality N, um, includes uh, rotations, but also reflections. And of course, we have the um, uh, the translations. Um, yeah, okay, let's um, let's now see how, how we program this. So for me, it's um, useful to think of this as latent node positions in the same 2D space at least for uh, the intermediate, um, the hidden layer activation, the hidden layer uh, positions. Um, what's the argument for updating them or what's the argument for, um, so in many tasks, let me phrase like this, in many tasks, we actually do want to predict positions as well. We want to predict uh, the future positions of the nodes. This is not the case with, um, with the super pixel lens here. But there are a lot of uh, tasks that involve uh, position prediction. Let's see. Okay, so like, it's not in this case, it's irrelevant. So you did want to get out of final prediction. 
it, it's not on, okay. It's not only relevant in that case. Uh, perhaps it is motivated by that case or inspired by that case. Um, but um, um, in general, it is um, yeah, what, what differentiates it between uh, standard M MPN and. Yeah, it has a component of linearity or complexity to it in the sense that if one of the neighbors is more important than others, mm -hmm. but it has a very close distance, but you know, and other neighbors have a similar distance. And if you only use this distance based variance to, to condition your computation, what you can do is actually move this important node a bit closer towards you such that you can better discriminate it from the other ones. And it, it gives you another mechanism to differentiate between neighbors um, just by moving the, the spaces around. And you can, uh, sorry, as a, as a side note here, uh, this uh, highlight part that I have here, this can also be a function of uh, the updated node positions. So the fact that you weigh your neighbors differently um, is kind of iteratively taken into account in the um, message passing. There was another question? Yeah. Can I put a point to uh, the term distributed point? Is there any method that we have? Three particles in the previous space that were perfectly aligned, they would only be able to move in that same axis, no? But you wouldn't be able to. Yeah. Yeah. So that's. No one said it's perfect. That's, um, <laughs> it could happen, but then maybe if you only have three particles, it will never move away from this line. Uh, that's what you're referring to. Yeah, so that's a, some of the general case. And, and it's highly unlikely that they would be exactly in line, uh, which is heuristic in a, case, in a sense, but it's also kind of mathematically principled. Um, any other questions before we uh, move to the programming of EGNN? Please. <laughs> Feel free? No? Okay, cool. Um, okay, so uh, EGNN, um, you will notice that it has a similar um, construction with uh, with MPNNs that we saw before. Um, again, we have the methods, uh, the methods in the update net are two layer MLPs. Um, and um, we have the pause net here, which uh, if we go back to the equation, let me try to share both at the same time. Yeah. Uh, so this uh, pause net, it is um, the implementation of uh, phi p. So we see that it outputs one number here. Uh, the message in the update net are mostly the same. Uh, and then uh, if we move to the, the message function, Again, it is a concatenation of um, the sender features, the receiver features, and the edge attributes, if we have them. <clears throat> um, and uh, the, uh, yeah, the, uh, the message for, uh, for positions is the relative position multiplied by the uh, phi, phi p of the message, which is the position net of the message here we have. So we have this scalar quantity here uh, that multiplies uh, the uh, relative positions. Uh, and then uh, the concatenation that we do here is mostly an implementation trick uh, so that uh, we're compatible with um, with Python geometric that expects one output message. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Uh, what's the type of the pause with the transition out? So is that like uh, coding to many? Is that like actual coding system? Usually it's the standard 2D value or 3D value if we're in three dimensions. Um, so the pixel location in, the, in that particular uh, data set that we have. Um, most of the times, not always, but most of the times, at least in my experience, um, equivalent networks use either the raw positions or if we go to the spherical harmonics, they use something like that. Uh, this is somewhat uh, n normally. Uh, so, EGNN, if I recall correctly, doesn't do any kind of normalization. 
uh, due to the fact that it uses relative position, it implicitly has a normalization built in. Um, you have to be careful with normalization with equivariant graph networks and equivariant networks in general, I guess, um, because the normalization can break the symmetries. Um, and so, for example, the standard normalization, the standard mean max normalization or the z-score normalization, if you do it per uh, feature dimension, then you uh, change the geometry of the problem. Uh, so if you scale your x coordinate differently, differently than your y coordinate, then you change a few things that you shouldn't. So usually um, you need to do some sort of isotropic scaling, which means that you treat all coordinates uh, the same way. Um, any other questions? Cool. Uh, so that's the uh, the message function, uh, and the in the update function. Uh, we, before we concatenated the message, which was an implementation trick, because uh, Python Geometric wants us to output a single message. Now in the update function, we split it again into the two different messages that we have. <laughs> um, and then we uh, we use the update net to update um, the messages, and we uh, also update the positions using the uh, position message. And we build a full we build a full uh, EGNN by mostly stacking uh, EGNN layers, uh, same as before. We might have an input embedding. We might have uh, a pooling function depending on the problem. So here uh, we will again perform experiments on uh, superpixel lemnist. So we, we again have a pooling function and uh, an MLP on top of that pooling function to transform the pooled vector to the final representation of the graph. Um, let's see, oops. Uh, am I meant to uh, change things here? Mm. Are we meant to use this? Instead of this? Yeah, I think so. No, yes. Mm. No. Uh, we don't have anything here. Oh, yeah. We can upload the one. That's the one something that should be loaded. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Cool. we can just cool. skip this part. Okay. Um, can we do this though? Or, um, okay. And then, um, then we want to actually um, verify that EGNN is uh, equivalent. Under rotations, under rotation transformations, um, and compared to uh, the three MPNNs that we saw before, which are not. And um, I leave that as an exercise for you, I guess, <laughs> because I have to uh, at this point. Um, but if you run the experiments, you will see that indeed um, the um, EGNN is equivariant. Uh, the other um, uh, the, the the other three are not or yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Then uh, perhaps we can uh, briefly discuss this um, question that we have here. Uh, so um, how do you think that uh, these models would work under different uh, groups under different transformations? We discuss rotations and translations mostly. Um, what about reflections? Sorry? Uh, why is that? Okay, that's <laughs> apart from that, or why does the paper say so? Uh, Reflection reflections means that we reflect the whole uh, image in that case, the whole super pixel, uh, and the, yeah, the whole lens digit, not just two digits. Well, digits. Um, well reflections can uh, place the nodes in different locations than before. It's not that we permute them. Uh, EGNN is equivalent uh, under uh, reflections because reflections are also distance preserving transformations. 
So we, uh, when you do a reflection, uh, the distance between the nodes or the relative positions, the distance between the nodes doesn't change. Um, and but if we think about scaling, for example, uh, if we were to kind of dilate the the eminence pixel, uh, sorry, the eminence digit, uh, then the distances between the nodes change. Um, and yeah, and thus EGNN is not equivalent uh, to scaling transformations, um, which makes sense because the scaling is not part of the Euclidean group. <laughs> yes. How is it possible to run EGNN when we do not have a coordinate system like the Zinc? Uh, I haven't really worked with Zinc. Uh, I don't know if it has. Uh... I think it has, right? Or some kind of thing. Okay, in general, if 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 a graph doesn't have coordinates, then you don't really. So there's uh, no any way. Yeah, but are you referring? I think uh, so now we thought about geometry really in the experimental sense, so like uh, distances, uh, maybe angles, but geometry could also mean topology, like how things are connected, and uh, so you could. Have different node embeddings uh, using the use of a coordinate embedding, like where is it in space? But you can also think of a node embedding that says something about the local topology, like how densely connected is this node that's a meter that mm -hmm. has a meter And this is sort of like the fusion of random walls or replacement trees or something. Um, so that's the kind of thing that you could still do in a graph where you don't have the positions. Um, yeah, but then you talk about different types of and the symmetries that we talked about here are maybe then related to yeah. yeah. Um, okay, next, are there any questions? Can we move on? Okay, so next um, we will um, look at a different data set. First of all, we will move to the 3D space and we will look at MD17, which is um, a data set uh, for uh, molecular chemistry. And um, let me uh, let me show you some visualizations of the graphs again, so that you get oh, again with this, um, so that you get an idea of what's going on. Cool. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is an example graph uh, in MD17. Uh, we have, uh, you see, three different colors of atoms. Uh, they correspond to different, uh, uh, so one is uh, oxygen, one is carbon, and one is hydrogen. I don't remember which is which by now, but I guess based on their sizes, you can figure out which is which. So the smallest one, the blue one, would be hydrogen. Um, because it has an index of one, the um, the hexagon here is compri comprises uh, carbon atoms, and the red ones are uh, uh, oxygen. Uh, and so this is a data set that, uh, if we look at the, uh, can we look, wait, um, it has um, node positions, and the features of the nodes are um, uh, their their type whether they are oxygen or um, or carbon or hydrogen. And in this case, we can we, we do use embeddings to, uh, or we transform them to, uh, to one foot vectors. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, the task, uh, there are two tasks for this data set. We'll, um, for now, we'll talk about the first one, which is energy, predi energy prediction. The second task is force prediction. Uh, I don't know if we will go over that. But um, again, we have uh, a task that is uh, graph regression. We try to predict a number, a real number for the whole graph. And um, let's see. Um, and if we, uh, we have to compute some, uh, here we compute some data set statistics, some training set statistics. That we uh, that we are using to normalize uh, our predictions and our losses, uh, and 
if we were to train uh, the MPNNs that we defined before and EGNN, uh, which again, I guess I will not be doing. Um, we will, you will see that um, they uh, they don't really perform well and they uh, don't really seem to learn more or less anything. Um, and um, yeah, this uh, is this is an indication that we might need to uh, use more expressive quantities or more expressive features in our network. And this um, leads us to go from starting from MPNN to EGNN and now to SEGNN or um, in general um, networks that are um, actually using equivariant quantities and not exploiting um, invariant quantities. Um, do you have any questions before we go there? Cool. Um, so we will um, briefly talk about SGNN. Um, I would like to start uh, with uh, some visualizations of spherical harmonics, which are one of the workhorses for um, for steerable for steerable E three GNNs. Uh, the other one is the Clash Gordon product. Um, Eric talked about in the lecture. Uh, Eric, did you talk about the spherical harmonics as well? Yes. Cool. Um, yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Um, so spherical harmonics are um, functions on the sphere. Oops. That's it. Yeah. Um, so spherical harmonics are functions on the sphere. Uh, so if you look at this, uh, yeah. Uh, so we go from S two, which is the the sphere. Um, you can think about it, you can think of it as uh, two angles, theta and phi, uh, or you can think of it as x y z coordinates, but they are normalized to have norm one, um, and they they output a real um, value. And um, you uh, saw here on the blackboard, uh, I see the, the equivalent, which is the, uh, the 2D equivalent, which is the Fourier transform. Uh, so in, in two dimensions, we have uh, increasing uh, frequencies. We have the complex exponentials of increasing frequencies. And um, all of these uh, create a complete basis. The same is true for three dimensions with the spherical harmonics, uh, but things are a bit more involved. And now we have the uh, we have two indices that we index our spherical harmonics. One is the order um, L, and then we have the uh, the index M here. Um, and uh, spherical harmonics have uh, a few desirable properties. One of the most important is that they transform predictably under rotations, uh, which is um, this equation here. Uh, so <clears throat> if we were to uh, rotate our input x, which you see um, here, uh, and then um, compute the spherical harmonics of the of these. Um, it, this is equivalent to computing the spherical harmonics of the original input, and then transforming it with um, uh, this matrix D, the representation, uh, which is the Wigner D matrix. Um, for for these uh, for this particular order L, um, and um, yeah, I would like to um, um, to show some visualizations to you uh, because at least for me they were the first time, the first few times that I saw these um, the spherical harmonics and their visualizations. It it's not clear what they are, what they do, and um, it's hard to get your head around them. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you've seen you've seen this or um, most commonly if it renders um, this. Uh, have you seen this before? I guess so. One or the other or both. Cool. Uh, so uh, for me, this uh, this uh, representation here with the warping it. It's very useful once you understand what's going on, but it's better to start from from the 
um, original, let's say, representation. Um, so here, each row represents a different order. And um, again, if you go back to the 2D case of the Fourier transform, you have increasing frequencies um, the more you, you go. Uh, here, we, we have the same. And you can see, for example, here, this uh, in the uh, fourth row, um, we have uh, higher, higher frequencies in some of the components. Uh, while on the other hand, um, in the first row, we have the, the DC component, let's say. Um, in the first row, we have kind of one period, um, and then we have two and three and so on. And um, is that clear? Uh, any questions? <clears throat> okay, and then oftentimes you see um, these visualizations instead, um, which are the exact same thing, except that we uh, we're now plotting it slightly different. We're warping, um, which means that we, um, we practically multiply our uh, coordinates by the um, absolute values. If I were to um, to show you uh, programmatically how that actually is, so this this all happens here. Um, this is what um, changes the visualization. Um, so we have uh, the grid in that case is a kind of a mess grid function uh, in, in three dimensions. Um, and if we were to multiply this with um, uh, the absolute values here, uh, we get the warped um, figure. Uh, and as far as I know, there are also other kinds of Results of spherical harmonics, but I've, I've never used them in practice, so I can't really um, tell you their, their benefits. Uh, and um, yeah, I think now it's, um, uh, you've probably seen, wait, uh, where was it? Oops. And we have the figure um, from SGNN, uh, where it was part of the tutorial, right? Do we remove it? No. It's below? Yeah, it's upper, I think. Up. Yeah, I can see it here, but <clears throat> yeah, what is it? Steerable feature vectors. But I think there is this, yeah. Ah, why is it like that? I think here. Um uh, the lectures to have that. Okay, but it doesn't really matter. But um uh, what I want to show you is um uh if we start from um a direct delta on the sphere. Um, what are its um, spherical harmonics? And this is um, one of the figures in, in SGNN, um, I think it's figure two, um, and it's, it's a quite common um, visualizations of how vectors transform under um, spherical harmonics and rotations. Uh, and so here I have, um, in this visualization, I'm showing you a, a smooth approximation of a Dirac delta. Otherwise it would just be a point on the sphere. I saw a red dot on, on, a blue, on a blue sphere. Uh, here it's, I'm visualizing a smooth um, approximation. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, before we, we actually go there, um, again, if we uh, make an analog with a 2D case, uh, if you have a pulse or an impulse or a direct delta in two dimensions and you try to approximate it, uh, you start with kind of uh, a sync function, uh, which is a decaying sine wave, let's say. Uh, and then um, it gets, if you try to kind of uh, push it together in, in one point, it becomes sharper and sharper. Uh, but you also have some artifacts. Uh, so you see what, this is uh, the approximation with um, an order of three, rather poor approximation. Um, and then uh, have five, seven, and 11. Uh, and you see that with 11, we, we already have um, something good, uh, especially for such a hard signal to model. Uh, but you also see some artifacts, um, which uh, are these ringing artifacts that we also have in two dimensions. Um, is, it, is it okay if I draw on the board? Or just for, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, also, I'm actually trying to explain this during the lecture also. Yeah, so when you, when you have this, 
when you have a pulse in two dimensions and you try to approximate it with um, with a Fourier transform, uh, over here you have this. So you have this uh, so-called Gibbs uh, phenomenon uh, ringing artifacts uh, because it's very hard to approximate. Um, well, it's practically it's impossible to approximate. Uh, this uh, pulse with a finite number of uh, sinusoidal uh, functions. Um, you have this uh, ringing artifact that would theoretically go away if you have infinite uh, sinusoidals, but in practice we do have them. And uh, you see the same thing here, um, even with 11. And um, yeah, unfortunately I cannot visualize uh, more than that with E3 and N because Spherical harmonics of higher order are not implemented. I don't know why. <laughs> um, um, yeah, and uh, then if you do the same uh, with the warping, you see this um, uh, shape that that's also in um, uh, in SGNN. Um, oops. Anyway, uh, but you, uh, I guess you can understand what's going on more or less. Um, so you get. Um, more and more uh, kind of uh, towards the peak um, that we have these um, artifacts. Oops. Uh, any questions about that? Is that uh, is that helpful? Uh, and then, uh, so um, I find this useful because um, if you think about uh, a direct delta on a sphere, um, it might seem kind of far-fetched uh, to have such a signal, but then um, a unit uh, kind of a unit velocity, for example, or a unit force, a force that's normalized to have a, vector, to have a normal fun is, uh, if we think about it as a signal on the sphere, it's a direct delta on the sphere. Um, so it is useful to, <clears throat> uh, to think about uh, such signals. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, the plan was for me to stop here. Uh, are we? Uh, what time is it? It's, we have still have time. Yeah, sure. Sorry. What do they? Uh, nothing really. Uh, I mean, red is um, red is high activations. Blue is in that case, I guess zero. Uh, is there a negative value? No, I think it's zero. Um, I don't think in this law that makes it the same with the force that it makes it values. Because if you look at this uh, glyph, the deformity of the delta thing, it should be negative on one side and positive on the other side. Mm. Yeah. So, okay, no, I'm actually not so sure. So I think, the, uh, I think in the visualizations, I, I didn't write that part, but I think in the visualizations, there's a normalization. Uh, normally in the, this color map, the white should be zero. Uh, but uh, here, I don't think we have negative values. Um, but in, in any case, red is the highest, blue is the lowest. Um, I was actually reiterating one message of this convolutional view that like, these spherical harmonics could represent functions on the sphere as just mentioned. And what could it represent? It could represent a feature value uh, coming from all different directions, just like if you have a 2D image, you have a feature value assigned to each pixel, like at this location, I detected this feature. Same, you can think of the spherical signal like from this direction, I obtain this feature, like uh, some sort of molecular structure. And from this direction, I <coughs> observe another feature. And if you want to be expressive in some sense, you know, if you want to localize these features to be very precise on, hey, it came from this direction and not from that direction. And you can only do that if you increase the number of spherical harmonic components, uh, because you see here that the, the block gets more and more sharper and the higher frequencies you introduce. And that essentially means that you're better able to distinguish a pattern coming from this direction than from this direction. It could be helpful for a neural network. But I think also as generally, as I said in the lectures, like you can get specificity not just by increasing the spread harmonic order, but also by going deeper into your network and using certain kind of activation functions. So in the end, as always with deep learning, there's a lot of heuristics. Some things work, some things not, but this is the intuition about this uh, maximum frequency. Like how good are you in localizing certain patterns?
Um, are you taking over now, or was it? Um, yeah, if this closes <laughs> part of it, it could be a break. Yeah. Um, uh, I yeah. Uh, our my, our suggestion is to uh, we're gonna take a break. Um, to uh, stop now and um let you work on this yourselves. Uh, whether you want to start from scratch or uh, from the top or to continue from this uh, SCGNN, as that's your colleague is. Um, yeah. Okay, and then uh, did that conclude your part or was that already picked up? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's one more thing that I want to show, but um, it comes later and maybe uh, I'm going to also show it, uh, which is the radial component of. Um, I guess okay. We can we can uh, briefly discuss that. I guess, and then we can stop. Uh, or maybe Eric, if you want to, uh, did uh, you okay. analyze this part here, the um, decomposition uh, between the uh, radial part and the uh, the angular part? Yeah. So I don't know. I'm thinking about the Uh, what is it? No, what is it? Yeah, you continue. Yeah, I've, um, it started recorded. So, yeah. So I think, yeah, uh, previously, uh, Miltos um, introduced something about the spherical harmonics. And that is, um, as we said, um, predict predictable to um, rotations. So that if we are constructing a network composed of this um, spher spherical harmonics, then we can say that this network is equivalent to rotations because the spherical uh, harmonics is um, equivalent to rotations. So let's see something about this. Um, this um, how do we make the, um, the trans the transformation, let's say the MLP using the spherical harmonics and give us a small spherical harmonics as an output and make them equivariant. So the first thing I'm going to introduce is uh, this E3 equivariant MLP. So um, let's just um, firstly skip this part and just stick this part. So we can see that um, if, if we have two input here, so let's say this HL1 and HL2 are two spherical harmonics. Um, and we want to use this two input um, and derive a output, which is also a um, spherical harmonics. And here you, we can see that the, um, we, can, we can use this W to um, parameterize each pair, each possible pair of outputting the, um, the part of the spherical harmonics, let's say, um, if we visualize this this input and output, we can see that here we have the input um, in the form of five scalar value and five type one vector. This is uh, so the first input is um, composed of these two component, and the second input is just a one scalar value and one um, type one vector. And then we want the output to be um, three scalar, three type one, and three type two vectors. So um, we can use this um, O3 fully connected tensor product to give us the possible paths from this two input to the output. So you can see that this path represents the, the, the possible a combination, let's say, if we look into this path. So it means that uh, this five um, type one vector can be combined with this type one vector to derive this type zero vector, let's say just a scalar. So this means that we can just simply um, do the dot product between this two type one um, tensor to have this type zero tensor, let's say. So also um, this line um, will be assigned a weight W in our neural network saying that um, if we want to combine this two um, tensor, uh, let's say the spherical harmonics, which which um, weights should, should we give to this um, to this output? So it's more like a matrix factor multiplication, but but it is dealing with the um, spherical harmonics. So um, 
this um tensor product is um is the core part or is let's say the the um workhorse in our um O3 MLP. So we will use this to um, parameterize our um mm, let's say MLP and um use it as a transformation for the spherical harmonics. This is a complicated thing, and it's good to, to understand a bit what's happening. I could say one more thing about it, and that's what does it say? This is my input feature, could be type one as a vector, but could be a scalar. And then I have another uh, object, so like the spherical money I'm learning, maybe, which could also be a scalar type or a vector type. And these show all the allowable combinations. If I take a scalar and a scalar with the two lines, from this, I can construct only another scalar, but we see no trajectory from this point towards type one and type two, because you cannot multiply two scalars and get a vector out of it. It's just not possible. And that's what the Klebsch-Gordon tensor product encodes. So there's no path from two scalars to vectors. But from two vectors, I can compute a scalar by taking the inner product. From two vectors, I can compute another vector by taking the cross product. And from two vectors, I can compute contain something or make something that has a frequency two or something like that. Yeah, know, but, uh, but, uh, um, yeah so and this sort of captures all possible paths. So that's sort of this code charts out again what are the allow allowable multiplications that you could do and then each of these lines can be seen in a separate way. Um, yeah so in, in order to frame it like sort of a layer just like you would with matrix vector multiplication. Yeah. And also um I think this um this manipulation corresponding to this one. So we have the input vector here, um, stable um, um, vector, and we have this um, um, partially evaluated as spherical harmonics as well. So we have this two input and we got the output and this weight is just parameterized by that um, fully connected tensor product here. So this is corresponding function that we have in the lecture. Also, um, okay. So before we go into, um, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's really like this a very special case if you move up to the make up the line diagram. If you suppose your this is tensor product and it, the in the rise plot you always insert the value one, which is just a scalar. And then you multiply one with the first scalar here and assign it away. Then you multiply one with another uh, scalar, give it a different weight. So if this is just a vector of scalars, the output of this trajectory will be just a linear combination of these scalars, or, or in other words, just a matrix vector multiplication. And so this is really to parameterize the maps that you can do. And um, yeah, so also if this is the value one, if you have a scalar and a vector, you can sort of start mixing vector. You add a bit of this vector, you add a bit of that vector, each uh, each vector in this uh, type one uh, stack receives its own weight, weight, and then you mix it. So you can compute the weighted combination of these vectors. So, yeah, but that wouldn't be conditional on anything. That would be conditional on the value one. And then it's just a linear combination of the things that you're dealing with. Um, yeah, and then you can insert spherical harmonics there. Then you can sort of also make it dependent on this other thing. And so there's a priori no other meaning than that. Other than just a, a computation of two to start combining the stuff that you have into different, you know, uh, learnable quantities. Yeah, I guess it should I think of it like if you were listening to type one, like you're taking the product of two type one like these trajectories have particular meanings, right? So we tend to think of inner products as something, but also cross products. And if you have a cross product of two vectors, the length of the output vector tells you something about the area that the two vectors span. 
And that's the kind of stuff that could then just be represented by these kind of layers. Like how, how important do I think that there's a certain area between these vectors? And that's then another feature that can be passed along to more vectors. Yeah, so it's just, yeah, so I find it hard to put a simplification on this, but on a high level, it's okay, we have all these geometric quantities from which we can derive other stuff by taking products, uh, uh, such as areas that will be computed, the length of a vector, which is the coordinates of the track, and maybe the square root or something like that. And so all these geometrically meaningful quantities can be inferred for linear theory from this. Sure. So, yeah. So uh, once we have this um, fully connected tensor product, which param uh, parameterize our possible paths uh, from this um, two type um, L vector to another type um, L prime vector, then we will have that um, um, this nonlinearity is uh, forming by this gate function because we cannot uh, use that, um, uh, let's say element wise um, uh, nonlinear um, functions because it will destroy our equivariance. So in this uh, in, in this part we will introduce the this gate function, and you can see that here, we have all the scalars from the input representation, and we have the uh, all the um, um, uh, type L vector which is not the scalar, and we use the scalar here, to. Um, we use the scalar. Uh, we we use we con sorry, we construct the same number of um the scalar as in this um, type L vector to um, tune this type L vector, let's say, so that we will have the, the new um, nonlinear um, output. And that's that's how we construct our nonlinear functions after we do in this um, tensor product. So um, if we saw how we construct the O3 MLP, let's say first part is to use a tensor product and uh, let's, Again, see the forward function. Here is a self dot nat input one and input two, and we can see what nat is. So this nat is here. So we have first tensor product here, um, and we go if we go to the tensor product, then we have two input. One is uh, irreducible representation one and two, and we have a desired output form of uh, in in terms of the ir irreducible representation and we include the bias of its of each of the combination. So you can see that here we have the fully connected tensor product and we add the bias to each of the possible paths here. And we output our, um, our resulted um, tensor. So after here, we have this, um, we have this gate, which applies nonlinearity to our output um, um, spherical harmonics, and then we have the our, our output. So this is um, obviously the um, um, equivariant M MLP that we constructed using the spherical harmonics and that um, nonlinear uh, gate function. And after that, we can test our equivariance using this uh, O3 MLP here. I think I need to run it. No. Oh. Um, Wait. Um, yeah, I think um, after this tutorial, we'll give you a correct version of the notebook so that you can run this um, equivariance checking yourself. But you can see that after this um, processing, after 100 times uh, trying, we, we, we will have to see, or we will see that the input and output are equivariant to rotations, no matter how we rotate our input through this O3 MLP. And um, after this part, we will have the, the um, graph convolution, uh, um, steerable graph convolution network constructed here. And I will leave you uh, leave it as a, a self-reading part so that we construct this, this uh, convolution layer, which is very similar as the O3 MLP um, presented before. And we use this network to produce the force in that MD17 um, data set. And finally, we got some results here. So this uh, the last part of this tutorial is really just using all the um, definition we introduced before to construct the graph uh, convolution network and uh, steerable graph convolution network and play with the MD70 data set. That's all it's about. And I think, um, yeah, I think maybe we can end here. Yeah, okay.
can, one comment that I would like to make if you go to the testing at the various parts, mm. uh, I think it's important to note that uh, because we have kind of continuous group really, um, we cannot test for all elements of the group as we're uh, regarding. So for each data point, we would need to pick one or two or three or a collection of random uh, angles that we would rotate our inputs. Uh, Last comment, I guess, is that there are, of course, many more uh, covariant graph networks out there, all different kinds of philosophies. Yeah. Uh, more exotic, more simple. Yeah, but I hope that uh, with this research, you have gained a bit of skills of putting in perspective this, this more formal uh, group theoretical approach, because some are really efficient really well, like you talked about geometric technical assessment just now. I think that some of those operations can be framed as specific instances of the collection of the tensor product. And, uh, so it's good to have this perspective. Yeah. Right. I think that's oh. it, maybe, yeah. Thank you.